Am I wired? I'm wired. I'm wired. Um, let me just put up some keywords. Um, can I get them on? Where's my? There. Oh, bugger. Uh, yeah, these disappear rather quickly because I think I've got it on sleep after uh, a few minutes. Um, yeah, I started giving, you know, I've been lecturing at Nanjing uh, University for the last month. And I started, uh, whoop, I'm at the top here. Yeah, started doing, uh, you know, kind of doing the kind of the, the Hans uh, translation of concepts, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pinyin and the uh, English right across and run my lectures like that. So I thought, it's also good to have keywords because sometimes if you say, say, words, say names too quickly, you, uh, you, um, you miss them. But let me um, say something about, yeah, urban justice and neoliberalism. Um, I, um, yeah, I suppose I got, I, I got interested in, I, I was in a, got in a bit of an argument with the uh, Australian uh, philosopher Andrew Benjamin uh, in, at Goldsmiths and realized I didn't know anything about justice. He knows a lot about justice, you know, uh, does Andrew. You probably know his work. Um, and uh, I started thinking about justice sort of seriously. Not seriously. started thinking about it more and more. Um, and um, thinking about, you know, what might be a, you know, a regime of urban justice. And how, um, you know, how urban justice is a, uh, is a response to, to neoliberalism and is a... Uh, is overflows neoliberalism, is a critique of neoliberalism. So I'm trying to develop a bit of a, a critical theory uh, based on, I think there can be, not I am, I think there can be a critical theory sort of based on a notion of justice. Um, partly coming, you know, sort of obviously from Walter Benjamin's critique of violence and the idea of justice there. And then thinking it through as urban justice. Um, not primarily using Benjamin, but as consistent with Benjamin on justice. Um, partly because I'm, I don't like, the, so many theories of justice are a priori theories. You know, what is the condition of possibility of justice, right? You know, rather than where are we and how can this develop into something that might be just given a certain kind of politics, right? You know, starting from some kind of empirical, you know, and then moving towards something like justice. And I want to do something like that if it's possible. Partly because I work in China a lot, and the Chinese are incredibly a posteriori and not a priori at all in the way that they work and think, and a very embedded notions of you know justice and ethics and all sorts of things. And partly because I think there's a problem with a priori's, uh, big problems with all sorts of a priori's. Um, I suppose you. I mean, you're obviously a. I was, you know, I'm so pleased to get this, you as an audience. Um, I thought there might be undergraduates, but I can see that you've all read all the books that I'll probably talk about. Um, that um, I, I want to I think it through in terms of some kind of idea of the imaginary, okay? You know, justice in terms of some, some idea of the imaginary or the imagination. You know, not, not, the, you know, not the imaginary from the early Lacan, you know, which just reproduces stuff. Um, ideology and whatever, but you know, I, I'm, very, I'm very keen on the late Lacan's um, idea of topology and the topological subject, because topology is spatial, yeah? And I think we want to think the urban spatially, and we want to think urban justice spatially and perhaps topologically, and, you know, topolo topology is spatial, yeah? Um, and, and Lacan's um, so the late Lacan cannot hate the imaginary like the early Lacan did. Remember the late Lacan has the Borromean knot uh, in his notion of subjectivity, you know, and the Borromean knot has the um, imaginary, the, um, the symbolic and the real all tangled up in each other. And it's, it's, it's a positive topological subjectivity. It's, he rethinks multiplicity, right, as topology, you know, towards the end of his life. So... Um, I'd like to think like that, you know, to think like that, and maybe to think that socially. You know, what kind of social topologies can we talk about? What kind of socio-technological, you know, typology, topologies can we understand, and what kind of regimes of, um, of urban justice can we think about? Um, I, I like the idea of, um, just because I started with Andrew Benjamin, um, two things. One, 
you know, big dissatisfaction with not just, you know, Kant's, Immanuel Kant's, uh, you know, idea of morality as, you know, condition to the possibility stuff. Of course, I'm a addicted post-Kantian um, at the same time as, you know, you have to define the stuff against Kant's um, notion of space, right? Because Kantian space is a container, isn't it? Yeah, in which objects are in space, right? And topological objects are space. The objects are spatial. Yeah? They're not forms. Topical, topological objects are spaces of deformation. The objects become spaces of deformation. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, and uh, the kind of topolo topology idea, I think there's been a big kind of, you might, you know, a big mathematical turn, as it were. I don't like, I mean, I have to teach it, and I want to teach it, I guess, to my students, you know, Alan Badiou and you know, it's no longer to lose its you, right, in, in cultural theory, cultural studies. Um, and uh, the mathematical and, uh, you know, using set theory and, um, and topology is, of course, mathematical. It's from, uh, it's from geometry, you know, and geometry is uh, irreducibly spatial. So we're talking about space and we're talking about something that is figural, I think. Yeah? It's figural, it's spatial. The imaginary itself, I think, is necessarily spatial and figural. It works in images, doesn't it? You know, unlike, you know, discourse, you know, it's, it's figural, right? Um, and um, I think that we need, to, we, need to, we need to do this somehow and think of it in terms of, of justice. Indeed, I haven't, I, let me talk for two more minutes about the imaginary injustice and then go back to um, neoliberalism. <laughs> um, or should I talk about, let me talk about neoliberalism and then come back to it, right? Because we will get back to to this to this idea of critique, um, that uh, will be based on topology, based in the imaginary, based in a certain kind of topological imaginary, you know, that's necessarily spatial and figural. Okay, what about um, neoliberalism? Um, you know, that's great. You know, Michel Foucault's great book, that Birth of Biopolitics book, um, that came out seventy-eight. His lectures in seventy-eight, um, a year before. You really got neoliberalism anywhere, or two. You know, Thatcher and Reagan came in '79 and '80. Deng Xiaoping came in '78. So you know, India started going neoliberal about that time. Uh, Foucault just anticipated all this stuff. God knows how. Um, and um, I, I think that there's a big, there's a massive difference um, between liberalism and neoliberalism. And it kind of works on that in his biopolitics book. I mean, liberalism is not a mode of biopolitical. Governance, just neoliberalism. Yeah. Liberalism doesn't work off of norms, just neoliberalism. Liberalism is about markets. Markets aren't norms. Yeah. Neoliberalism is about institutions. Yeah. Institutions are, are norms. They, and of course, Foucault stuff is all about normative regulation, and biopolitics is normative regulation. Neoliberalism is, um, uh, well, you know, liberalism, on the one hand, you've got exploitation, Marx, right? You know, who's writing Das Kapital in 1867 and, you know, in debate with Mark, Ricardo and Smith, right? Um, and, 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 you know, for Foucault, of course, the entrepreneur is a, the liberal entrepreneur is kind of an interesting thing. And, and it opens up all sorts of urban space and, and indeed public space. So the kind of very positive public space, you know, I don't even want to use the word positive, the kind of opening of public space that you get in books like, uh, Habermas's original Struktur Wandel der Öffentlichkeit, The Structural Change of the Public Sphere, that he wrote in 62, which wasn't an a priori book. You know, later his, his justice becomes a priori. He talked about England and debating societies and shit, you know, and, and, and you know, the science societies and all this kind of stuff, the Royal Society of X and Y and Z, you know, where the actual concrete public sphere happened. And Richard Sennett's, of course, in Paris, the same sort of time, mid 18th century. Markets opened up certain kind of spaces. You know, Adam Smith writes the moral sentiments, right? As well as the wealth of nations. So on the one hand, you, but, but this, not, this is not normative regulation. It's a space pos partly of, 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 of stuff opening and freedom. And even the exploitation side, you know, it, it's not normative dominance. You know, when you get dominated at the point of production or through exchange value or something else, markets don't govern normatively. Institutions do. And that's what neoliberalism does. Neoliberalism is institutional. 
the best you know, formulation of it is in institutional economics. It's the Chicago School, the Chicago School of Law and Economics. Foucault does Gary Becker you know, there, but, and Gary Becker is close to those, those guys. You know, Gary Becker takes the entrepreneur, he takes the risk-taking entrepreneur from Frank Knight, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, right? And he turns it into bloody human capital, right? So it used to be opening up space for, you know, Frank Knight's uncertain entrepreneur, the fourth factor of production, right? Becomes human capital, becomes a, uh, a space of domination, a space of institutional domination where people self-accumulate their capital in institutions like mine and yours. Um, but the main theorist there is, of course, is, is Coe's in institutional economics. Coe's won a Nobel. And there you see, you know, Coe's, you get um, the theory of the firm, right? Ronald Harry Coe's, he's 103 years old. He's from Northwest London, and settled in Chicago. But it's law and economics, the theory of the firm, vertical integration, horizontal integration, hierarchies. Why is it that we have firms? Coe's asks the question. The answer to save on transaction costs. But it's for the first time vertical and horizontal integration get theorized. You don't get this even in neoclassical economics. Coase does this. This is neoliberalism. So uh, he uses the contracting language, and his big articles are in the Journal of Law and Economics. So it's normative. Institutions work normatively. Markets work through demand. The firm works through command. It works normatively. It works through biopolitical domination. Coase then writes the, prob the, uh, the, um, social, the, the problem of social costs, right? Famous piece. Uh, you know, you get you you have economic you have negative ex externalities right of markets to start with, and you have a welfare state. And for for Coase and for our government in England, this is a problem, a welfare state. So how do you then solve the problem of social costs? Well, for Coase, what you do is well-defined property rights. If you have well-defined property rights, then the firm itself has to deal with the externalities, and you don't need a bloody welfare state. Right? To, 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 to deliver the public goods because the firm is responsible for its own externalities. Yeah? It's rights. It's, it's institutional. It's law. It's law. Yeah? Um, so you see this right through. And of course, it's rights. It's normative. It's a normative governance. That's what biopolitics is. Markets don't do this stuff. Big change from Marx to Foucault. Big change from liberalism to neoliberalism. Massive, massive, massive. From Adam Smith to institutional economics. Institutional economics plays itself out into institutional urbanism. Cosian economics is massive now, today, everywhere in the world in urban planning. Transaction costs, institutional economics. There's also a reaction to it, as we know. I mean, people like Paul Krugman doing his kind of uh, regional and urban. The possibility, I, th I think what I want to talk about is how can we develop new public spaces with the disappearance of the public you know, that you get in neoliberalism and this kind of institutional and normative domination. So the problem is norms, norms and forms, norms and forms, yeah? Norms and urban forms, right? Um, social norms and urban forms. You get both in Foucault, Kant, you get the urban forms in the kind of container space that we've got to deform in order to get, uh, in order to get a topological space and a space of crit critique. So you've got to violate the norms and you've got to violate the forms in order to get justice. You've got to do violence to the norms. Benjamin said this. It's, not a, it's a critique through violence. He doesn't say violence is bad. He says law is bad in the critique of justice. And there has to be a certain kind of violence, including, of course, a messianic violence, yeah? A messianic violence against, against law. And I think a lot of cultural theory today, um, you know, think about um, Alan Baju's uh, St. Paul book or Agamben's uh, St. Paul book. There's a big critique of law, justice against law, yeah? And for Derrida, justice is the um, deconstructible, as we know. So um, what I'm trying to say is that um, is, 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 is neoliberalism um, destroys public space yeah? and creates a, a, a form of governance, of biopolitical governance, right? Through institutional norms as economics becomes institutional, yeah? through human capital, through all these, these sorts of things that become spaces of, of domination and biopolitical power.
So what kind of, uh, res what kind of uh, critique do we need here? Not an a priori theory of justice, either Kant's categorical imperative, or the late Habermas, you know, who says, oh, discursive will formation. Well, again, it's, what are the conditions of possibility, right? We don't have this, you know, but what are the conditions of possibility of justice? We have to start from where we are and think about, we have to think about what is urban space like today? What kind of social and spatial and other kinds of relations are we in today? And technological, and what kind of, what kind of, what kind of possibilities of justice can develop from it? You know? And um, I suppose, um, on the one hand, um, and I'll come back to this in a second, neoliberal, part of this comes through, I think, the unintended consequences of the actual institutions of neoliberalism, yeah? including institutional urbanism. Okay, liberalism works through property, neoliberalism works through intellectual property. Yeah? When Coase uh, puts his arguments about transaction cost, and of course, Oliver Williamson then writes his book, The Economic Institutions of Capital. Capitalism wins a Nobel, both win Nobel Prizes, right? Williamson just last year, I think, or two years ago. Um, they, um, their work is then used in, in the early 80s in the, in the Reagan administration to, justif to roll back anti-monopoly legislation, to justify monopolies, right? Because neoliberal, if liberalism is about um, about competition, Adam Smith, and then later you get this kind of cartelization and monopolies without competition, you know, from 1890 to whatever, organized capitalism, as John Murray and I called it. Um, what neoliberalism is about is competition between monopolies, yeah? competition between monopolies. And this competition, there's one, 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 one monopoly dominates, and then another comes along at some point and dominates, and this is determined by intellectual property rights. Intellectual property rights, Microsoft, Google, Apple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, what, we're, what we're talking about is, um, you know, where will the critique come? Some of it will come, you know, as 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 generated. Let me go back. I'll go back to the imaginary in a second, but let me just mention that, um, in a, to a certain extent, these institutions will produce their might par partly produce their own their own critique, their own violation. Neoliberal uh, institutions, as we know, produce their own externalities. The old externalities were, mar were markets, now they're institutions, yeah? Like, for example, environmental externalities, right? The finance crisis, right, itself came from the institutions of neoliberalism. Um, but there are also positive externalities. Um, and the positive externalities um, are, um, let me get down here a little bit. There's some, some stuff from, um, there's a great book, uh, a great article by a guy called Yokai, you might know it, Bankler, B-E-N-K-L-E-R, from, from Yale Law Review, which um, it's, a, it's essentially about, uh, it starts from, it's, it's, it, it's an open source sort of argument, yeah? It, a lot, of, a lot of the arguments are, there's, there's, a, there's also a great book called Cognitive Capitalism and a theory of cognitive capitalism that works off of the knowledge overflows, yeah, from contemporary cities. You know, you might work in Google, you might work in Microsoft, you might work writing software, but in your spare time, yeah, it, you know, there's, there, the, what's created, what's created is, well, people coming to lectures, people meeting in planning projects and, and ideas and writing software and putting together art and design and, and other kind of ideas. Um, there's a knowledge overflow. There are positive externalities here. And Yokai Bankler talks about them. And here kind of, uh, kind of an economics, uh, a critique of neoliberal economics comes together with kind of an open source argument, yeah? A new media kind of open source argument. Again, a critique of intellectual property that we're having in kind of media thought and media theory. And uh, coming together with a with a with a sort of um, with a different kind of intelligence, um, you know this you know there's an overflow there's the okay look you 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 bring together all these kind of people in a city like Sydney or or Shenzhen which has millions of you know hundreds of hundred thousand PhDs in China or New York or LA or wherever, and what you have is this tremendous kind of collection of intelligence, yeah. 
of information, of ideas, of symbolic capital that overflows the firms and that, and that actually partly constitutes, to a certain extent, a certain amount of the urban fabric, a certain amount of the urban fabric. This kind of stuff is not institutional. Sometimes it also kind of re-aggregates in networks, in networks, and actually networks themselves, I think, are not institutional. There's something else than institutions. Um, and all this stuff, I think, is, is, is part of the kind of overflow that, that, um, that, um, that, can create, that helps create certain kind of positive types of urban space. And actually, the overflow, these externalities, are part of urban space itself. They start constituting and producing urban space themselves. Um, they're unintended consequences, unintended consequences of these kind of ne neoliberal kind of institutions. So let me, um, let's, and the, 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 the key book here, there's a guy called Yan Mu Ye Butang. There's a j magazine called, he's the editor of Multitude, Multitude from Paris. And uh, there's, a, there's some stuff, it's called co Cognitive Capitalism, what he writes about Cognitive Capitalism and this possibility of new publics. Okay, let me say a little more about uh, the critique of neoliberalism and, and this, idea of, um, this idea of critique and urban critique, which is necessarily a, a spatial critique, and, and, and an idea of critique that works through the imaginary, that works necessarily through the imaginary. And 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Um, and I think this, is, I think this, makes, this makes a lot of sense. Um, we ask our question, and, and, I, and I, gave a, I gave a little bit of a clue in terms of what I want to think, how I want to understand the imaginary talking about Lacan a few minutes ago. Um, but um, I think we, can, we, can, we, we, have to, we have to go further than this. Um, now, if you look at um, you know, Kant's, uh, Immanuel Kant's three critiques, right? You've got uh, the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, and the critique of judgment. The critique of judgment is the aesthetic critique, right? Like the aesthetic critique, um, it's the critique of um, it's the critique of um, it's art and nature, and in there, of course, the you know and the, and the sublime and the beautiful, the imaginary plays an important role, a very very important role. Um, now, what what, what 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 Kant says is there. He says that the third critique is a bridge between the first and the second critique, b between the first and second critique, between 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 kind of action, practical practical reason, right? And between the what can I know? Remember Kant has the, the, his kind of what is enlightenment. What can I know? What shall, what, what, what can we know? What can I know? What should I do? Yeah. What can we hope? What can we hope? Yeah. And I think the key thing here for critique is the what can we hope? The what can we hope? The what can we hope? And I think it's not, it's not the what should we do. It's not the ethics. It's the hope. I think even in Marx, the kind of utopian element in Marx and others is at the center of critique, not ethics. The what can we hope, the what can we hope, I think, well, if the what can I do, what should I, what can I know, is a question of cognitive reason in the first critique, and, 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 and indeed the understanding in Kant. And the what, and the what should, what, what should we do is a question of reason. Then the what can we hope is a question of the third critique and the imaginary. Yeah? So the imaginary becomes the space of the what can we hope. Yeah? And what I'm trying to say is that we figure, we figure through this imaginary a future regime of justice. It forms a what can we hope. It forms a utopian, a moment of critique, a moment of critique. Now what kind of imaginary is this? It's interesting then that after Kant, you know, the early, the, like Ficht and Schelling, they not only say that the second critique or the imaginary is a bridge between the first and the third, but the imaginary is a condition of the possibility. It drives the whole show, yeah? So Ficht's eye, the eye in Ficht, is the imaginary. It's Kant's productive imaginary. It's no longer a condition of possibility, but it produces everything. It's a productive imaginary. And I think our imaginary should be some kind of productive imaginary. It's not an I, it's, it's something else. Heidegger comes back to this against the neo-Kantians when he writes Being in Time, after Being in Time, before Being in Time, the year before he gives his Kant lectures, right? The year after he writes his Kant and Metaphysics books. So it's his dealing with Kant. Being in Time is his dealing with Kant, yeah? After he writes Being in Time in the Kant and Metaphysics book, he says that Dasein is the imaginary. Dasein is the power 
of the imaginary. Yeah? Dasein, and this imaginary is temporal. I'm trying to argue that it's spatial, but it's also temporal. Yeah? It can produce a kind of urban space. If, you, if, if you're perceiving something, you can't imagine it. By definition, Aristotle said this. If you imagine it, it's either from the past or from the future. Retention or protention, as the phenomenologists say. But this, this kind of imaginary is, is, is Heideggerian temporality. It is the imagined death is Heideggerian death in being in time. It figures the whole thing. So the question then is, how do we move to a to kind of a contemporary, more kind of topological one? Well, this guy Peter Sloterdijk does this, and Peter Sloterdijk uh, is probably is now the uh, is Sloterdijk down here somewhere. There's Jan Mulier Boutin, Cognitive Capitalism, uh, or Sloterdijk, Benkler, Coase's Penguin, Sloterdijk. Um, Sloterdijk's whole work is about topology. He's he does a TV show in Germany. He's the hottest. The hottest, he, you know, next to Badiou, he's the hottest player these days. Um, he's on the, he's very big on the architecture tour, but he's actually very interesting. He's a crazy man, uh, Sloterdijk. Sloterdijk. Three volumes called Spheres, 2,400 pages, being translated by Semiotext. Um, if you can read a little bit of the French, do it's worth it. You know, in Spheres, um, Spheres. Three volumes called Spheres. Now, um, it works off of the difference between topography and topology, okay? Now topographical space is container space, okay? Topographical space is the space of biopolitics. It's the space of, of urban institutionalism, of urban planning institutionalism. It's the space of domination, through, of neoliberal domination. Uh, topography, yeah? Topology is different to topography. Uh, topography sees objects in space, topology doesn't. In topology, um, you see that, for example, the square and the circle and the triangle are topological equivalents. They're topological equivalents. Why they bend and twist into each other, you know? To be a topological equivalent, they belong to the same set. So it's a set theoretical thing, yeah? They share properties, you know, like, like, an, an, like being an inside and outside being divided by a line and being able to convert to each other without, you can't tear, you can't cut. You can bend and twist in topology to get your topological equivalents, right? The, so what happens in topology, I think, is, is the old form, the old Kantian form, becomes a space of deformation. A topological spaces are processual spaces. They're not fixed spaces of urban form. So neoliberal topographical, we have fixed spaces of urban form. The critique comes through topological spaces, which are spaces of continual deformation. Okay. There are spaces of deformation that privilege, I think, the imaginary very much more than, than anything else. How do they do this? Well, there's a couple things I can say about this. This is Peter Sloterdijk's idea um, and others and other people's ideas. Um, for one thing, the, um, the topological space becomes, um, okay, it's a space of deformation, the church, church characteristics. It's in constant self-transformation. Topological spaces do not determine. Topographical spaces are determined by something else, by capitalism, by institutions. They are determinant spaces, yeah? That's the trouble, of course, with any kind of a priori theory. There's some kind of determination. Topological spaces are self-determining. They're self-modifying, they're self-organizing, they're processual, they're in constant deformation. Um, a brand, like in my book, Celia Lurie's in my book, um, Global Culture Industry, we, t we talk about this, the coupling of, um, of culture industry objects and, and the social imaginary in that book. And the social imaginary, Celia runs a, top, a topology project, now a European project. Um, and um, the, um, the, the a brand is a, topo is a topological space. Topological spaces can be good and bad. Yeah. They can be, you know, they can be capitalist too. Because in a brand, you, you know, objects morph into each other. Brands are spaces of deformation. Brands are sets, right, in which you have seven or eight or nine or 12 different products that are the same brand. Yet they share certain properties and they morph into each other in certain ways. Brands are certain kinds of topological spaces. They're, they're also topological spaces in a certain way. Now, and there are, of course, also spaces in which the imaginary is, 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 is I think, again, the dominant moment um, because they're figural. You see, 
Somebody like Bud, sorry, I'm saying too much and too little at the same time. Yeah, a lot of these, I'm not trying to argue that we're not talking about the actual and the virtual, yeah? Because a topological space is an actual and a virtual at the same time. You know, the Deleuze stuff in which the virtual generates the actual. A topological space is different than that because a topological space is very importantly a surface. It is still the circle. It is still the triangle. It is still the square, as well as its deformative, it, as its shared properties, as its, as its process of deformation. So a brand isn't just the logo, it's also the products. It's, it's the bits as they morph into each other. Yeah? And I think that in some ways we are, to, the extent that we, we, to a certain extent, we are topological identities. Yeah? To the, or we are topological subjects, indeed. Lacan's theory of the, of the subject, the late Lacan, is topological. Yeah, it's it's the subject as multiplicity, is the sub it's the subject as not a form, right, but a space of deformation, a space of partly unconscious, largely unconscious, because we don't run, you know, as we self-organize these spaces, we don't say, oh, we're going to self-organize this space. They have structural properties that organize, that self-organize these topological spaces. They they self-organize through their structural properties. This is the wonderful book, and it's an old sociology book by Cornelius Castoriadis on the social imaginary, which is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and um, there, this you, you, we take this kind of Heideggerian imaginary. We, we you're no longer determined by being anymore, right? So it's become self-determining. So it's a self-organizing space instead of, and it becomes social. It's no longer a monad, but it becomes a dyad. I'm giving you guys too much, but you probably know a lot of it. Um, sorry. Um, <laughs> there, there's, okay, it's a space of the imaginary. Now, when, um, the way we understand it, or understood it already in the culture industry book, is through a, the, the dyad works through structural coupling, yeah? So what topological spaces become is some kind of systems kind of psychotechnical or socio-technical systems, because we're all engaged with technologies all the time, yeah? And these systems are, are self, partly self-organizing, but not just self-organizing. They're co-evolution, and they're not just system environment things, because as Slaughterdyke says, we create, man creates his own environment, incredibly, unlike kind of Darwinian other species. And what we're involved in, the dyad, is kind of a co-evolutionary, structural coupling. When Nicholas Luhmann or Francisco Varela, you know, this kind of cognitive neuroscience stuff, uh, talk about structural coupling, um, it's co-evolutionary and it happens on the level of structure, yeah? And the two coupling organizations exchange information, exchange symbols, exchange images, yeah? So you've got a, you've got an exchange of, uh, uh, you've got an exchange of also, that, that, that takes place on the level of the imaginary and this kind of diet. It can't be a monad because we want something social, I think. You know, we don't want just, as Heidegger, just a kind of isolated monad of, 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 of Dasein. So you've got this kind of, and I think what's really interesting is Luhmann here, Nicholas Luhmann here, as a sociologist. You know, in the old kind of, um, um, kind of in a topographical system, right, you have a, you have a system that doesn't self, talk at Parsons, right? You have a system that doesn't self-organize, it organizes from the outside, and it's functional, right? Lumen, it works through function, you know, it's all functional, right? Lumen gives you two, two things. He's got an idea of semantics. He's talking about communicating systems. These structural coupling systems are communicating systems. This is media theory, you know? It's not just, and it's urban theory. These structural and coupling, uh, coupled socio-technical systems are semantic systems. Lumen talks about them as semantic systems. There are, these systems are also functional, but the semantic overflows the, the functional, okay? You can imagine a functional system with a huge semantic or meaning element to it, and when the meaning element overflows the, um, the uh, functional aspect, this is where you get your change. And it's the semantic element that makes Lumen's systems, one, self-organize, because a straight functional system can't self-organize. The function determines it, right? It also, it's also where they structurally couple. Yeah, this is post kind of functional, as it were, 
some ways, post-industrial stuff. It happens on the level of the imaginary. It happens on the level of information. It happens on the level of communications. Yeah? It happens on the level of meaning. And Castoriadis calls the, um, the when Derrida says that, the, that justice is the undeconstructible, he's, I think he's saying, you know, we can, dis, we can deconstruct any signifier, but justice is kind of almost like a pure signified in being undeconstructible. Castoriadis calls the imaginary, which is a structure and a social, and at the, at the center of a, he doesn't call it a system, but a self-organizing kind of, op, a self-determining operation. He calls this where the chain of signifiers comes to an end at a kind of, again, a, a signified, yeah? So we're talking about a structure that's a structure that's a set of, that's a signified, it's a, it's a set of meanings. Something that for me is also at the heart of what um, Manuel Castells used to talk about many, many years ago of the city as a regime of meaning. The city is a regime of meaning. David Harvey, all those guys' work was so good when they were like 30 years old, wasn't it? You know, 35 or 40 years ago. David Harvey wrote that wonderful book, Social Justice in the City. Um, his book on neoliberalism is sort of interesting, but it's sort of superficial. Um, but he wrote great books when he was young, you know. Pardon me too, you know. But, um, but Social Justice in the City is a great fucking book, you know. And, um, but I think what we're talking about as a regime of urban, is something to do with urban justice. Yeah, an idea of urban justice and an idea of critique, yeah? Critique, which is a, a what can I hope? A what can I hope that was already in the imaginary for, uh, for Kant. And we remember that, you know, in Kant, it's only in the third critique. The first critique is about, all about the understanding, five minutes. Second critique is all about reason. The third critique, they all come together, yeah? You've got the symbolic, right? The understanding, the imaginary, Reason, perception, all together. Reminds me a little bit of Lacan's topology, where you get the real, you know, the imaginary and the symbolic together. But I think it has to be under the domination of the imaginary. And so what we're looking at is a, is a, is, is, is then a kind of, what I'm looking for, what we should be, maybe looking for, is, is an urbanism and an urban production of space, a production of urban space, a critique that it's at the same time of a, produ at the same time of production of space, yeah? A production of space, a phenomenology that's also a production of space. A phenomenology in Heidegger's sense that's driven by, uh, by a future imaginary, yeah? A future imaginary, but a social one. A social and future imaginary, temporally. But spatially, spatially it's always figured, yeah? It's always figured, only the figures enfold. There was this famous book on the fold. They enfold into a multiplicity. Yeah, topology is a multiplicity, a multiplicity that morphs into each other, morphs into themselves. So I think what we're looking at is a is a um, is taking you know Benjamin's um, critique of law, and the critique of law is also Foucault's critique of biopolitics, right? It's the normative, it's command, it's the imperative, it's determination, right? That that's being critiqued um, here, um, this critique of law. And, 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 and putting this kind of messianic, this, and the messianic is the what can I hope, of course. It's Kant's what can I hope. For Benjamin, it's never an a priori. Benjamin always starts with something. He starts with art. He starts with photography. He starts with architecture. And this architecture, this art, this photography opens up onto maybe a space of justice, yeah? and a space of something like the messianic, yeah? something else. So. What we're talking about is, 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 is that kind of possibility of critique, that kind of critique of normativity that is kind of neoliberalism, um, and one that can possibly, uh, possibly give us the possibility that, and the chance of, of, new kinds of new kinds of publics. So I'll stop there and uh, open it up for questions. Thanks very much.